Okay, it is time for me to turn things over to our third panel of the day. And uh, handling that panel is uh, my colleague Jim Boffman uh, from the School of Journalism. And, uh, well, that's all I'm going to say. Jim, you can take over and introduce your panel. I will begin our panel with a premise that sports fans have always had opinions about their teams and athletes, and some could be quite negative. Uh, still, those of a certain age could remember where opinions were not widely shared. Most of us could only complain to our friends at work or over an adult beverage or at the dinner table over an adult beverage. Athletes were occasionally criticized, but the critics were a priestly caste, columnists, mainly writing for larger metropolitan daily newspapers. And not all cities liked bitey commentators. I was struck by this when I came to Wisconsin in the very early 80s, I was very young, uh, by how gentle Milwaukee sports columnists were compared to the ones I consumed in New York and Cleveland. Red Smith at that point routinely referred to the owner of the New York Yankees, George Steinbrenner III, as George III. But that order of things, newspaper columnists with a platform and readers who had no choice but to receive their wisdom or vitriol, left to gripe in small groups, was beginning to change. Sports talk radio began to take off in the 1980s and 90s. Some hosts were themselves full of opinions, some quite harsh towards professional athletes. I'm thinking of Pete Franklin on WWE in Cleveland, who went on to the fan in New York. Many hosts encouraged callers who could be even less inhibited in their observations. Talk radio was only the first liberator. In the past dozen years or so, the internet has spawned a host of websites that will run stories quite brutal in their assessment of sports or those in the sports business. Like talk radio, most websites encourage individual visitors to post comments that can lower the bar further. Then there's Twitter. The old monopoly on opinion has been destroyed. Virtually everyone who had something nice or more often nasty to say now has an outlet. What we are experiencing, I believe, is a new coarseness in our conversations about athletes and others associated with sports, professional or amateur. To be clear, I am not seeking a return to the good old days when a few older white men at the Chicago Tribune and the New York Daily News were the only ones with access to a larger audience. And I believe a more skeptical, searching attitude towards athletes is on the whole a good thing. Still, I worry that the tone may at times be too snarky and even cruel. As William C. Roden of the New York Times wrote last August, the line between being thought-provoking and merely provoking has become blurred. Thoughtful discourse has been compromised. So I ask our most distinguished panel, have our conversations about sports become more coarse? And what, if anything, should journalists and others do about it? <laughs> Let me start with Chris. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, all right. Well, uh, uh, for those who don't know me, I am Chris Pooley. I punted for the Minnesota Vikings uh, for eight years. And uh, I've written a thing or two online. Some of you may have read them. Uh, I use colorful language at times. Um, but yeah, I, I think what we're talking about here is, uh, is an idea that for me personally, I grew up in the internet age. I grew up playing online games. I grew up with video game forums. So I am very familiar with <laughs> the types of conversations, or lack thereof, that happen on these forums. And generally, they devolve into name calling of really horrible types. And what you see from sports fans is kind of the barest fraction of what you see from video game fans. Any of you have experienced the recent Gamergate horribleness, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But what the thing is, is that that genie is out of the bottle. You're, there's a reason people say don't read the comments. There's a reason that PFT Commenter is a very popular satire account on Twitter now, because he says things that the commenters say on Pro Football Talk, and you read them, and you're like, that can't be real. 
no one could possibly say that, but people do say that, and they think they, they are right in saying that. And so what we need to do, what people need to understand is that there is a huge, there, there, there is a place for, for anger online. There is a place for saying something and, and calling something out, but there is a difference between punching up and punching down. And the difference between punching up and punching down is when you punch up, you are making fun of Walmart for not giving their workers a living wage. When you're punching down, you're making fun of the greeter at Walmart because of the way they're dressed. And those are two very, very different things. And so in the sports world, I know the ESPN people will love this. Um, I absolutely loathe first take. I cannot stand it because it is lowering the bar for everyone because it's profitable. That's the only reason they do it. They invoke the golden mean fallacy all the time. We're going to present these two positions, one of which is true, one of which is bullshit, as was stated so eloquently earlier, and somehow the truth must be somewhere in the middle. No, one is true, one is bullshit, and you're just trying to get people to talk about it because you know that's going to make you money. So, as sports journalists, if you were contributing to that problem by allowing these forms, by writing stories that are clickbait titles, by going after an athlete who says something interesting on Twitter that maybe you don't personally agree with, but at the same time isn't societally destructive, but you know that people are going to read your story because you wrote it, that's contributing to the problem. Don't go after an athlete when he says something interesting that you may not personally agree with. Go after the athlete when he says something like, oh, she deserved it because of what she was wearing. Because that is contributing to rape culture. That is a huge problem in colleges and in the NFL and in sports across America. I mean, the, the, those are the things that journalists need to be covering, and those, that's where the anger should be directed. Don't direct the anger and the snarky comments at those who, frankly, are undeserving or you know, just aren't part of the, the deeper problem. Direct it at the problem itself. Direct it at the structural problems. Direct it at the social problems and fix them. So yeah, sorry, I got a little, a little off topic no, That's there. pretty good for somebody <laughs> who played for the Vikings. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I had a lot of time on the sidelines. We did a lot of punting. Go ahead. Go ahead <laughs> Far away. Well, <clears throat> what worries me as I've gone from the olden days of the old white men at the Chicago Tribune, I think I was one of the old white men at the Chicago Tribune for a while. Um, <laughs> Uh, I spent 20 years at the Chicago Tribune. I'm, I'm old school as far as print journalism. Um, going to ESPN uh, after a layoff at the Tribune, uh, which was devastating, but, but now I see how, how great you know, new media is. It's not so new anymore. But um, my worry is I, is I also kind of ventured into teaching is that nobody reading newspapers anymore, or very few, sorry if, if there are newspaper writers out there. The I, I love them. newspapers, I'm sorry, I, lo I love it. But the kids are emulating and idolizing Skip and, and you know, a lot of this sort of meanest voices out there. I work with Skip, Skip's great, but you know, I don't want students to think that that's what they're, what they're majoring in. They're majoring in you know, going on TV and, and yelling. You know, that, that's not a job. I mean, that's, you know, be a journalist, and then maybe someday you'll be good enough, and then someone will ask you to be, go on TV and yell at people, and then fine. But, you know, earn your keep first. Uh, and I'm not seeing a lot of that. I mean, I actually had a student the other day who said, I said, well, what do you want to do? And he said, I, I'd like to, I'd kind of really like to be like Mike Wilbon. You know, I'd like to, you know, do some TV. I'm like, well, he spent like 35 years, you know, building up to the point where he's the Mike Wilbon that he is now. Um, so that's kind of what concerns me. But I mean, everything you said, you know, obviously hits home. It, it again it, to harken back when I'm not that old. I don't think I'm that old. But in the 80s and early 90s, we traveled with teams, um, and it was just sort of understood there were certain things that you didn't write about, or certain things that weren't interesting and weren't printable, and your editors didn't necessarily want to write about. I mean, if if uh, I walked across the street in Coconut Grove where the Bulls used to stay. And, you know, this was in their heyday. And, you know, one of the players was, a girl was sitting in one of the players' laps. I, I literally would turn and walk out of that bar because I didn't want to have to write. That was the first time I remember really being conflicted. You know, do I want to have to write about this other side? Do I want to have to, 
you know, get into this personal side. We weren't doing that, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and now, obviously, we're not talking about, I know I'm meandering around, I'm sorry, I'll get, I'll end. You can meander all you um, want. Uh, but, you know, what we're talking about, let's be clear, is, and I use this term a lot, and I'm not even sure what I mean, but I feel great comfort using mainstream press. We're not, you know, and I'm constantly urging students, you know, don't, don't say like, according to, you know, uh, Joe in his basement. You know, we don't care about Joe in his basement. That is not legitimate, you know, media. Uh, just to repeat what you hear on the internet is not good enough. You know, we need to have original content, original reporting. Um, and there needs to still be an acknowledgement. I, I'd like to say I, I'm confident that the mainstream press, quote, legitimate press, is still doing a responsible job. And that when they do get mean, it's based on fact. When they do write columns, they're basing it on fact. I'm still confident my, the colleagues I work with are doing that. So we're talking about now the fringe, we're talking about citizen journalists, that it's not so fringe anymore. The, the numbers are huge and it scares me, it does. And it's not the anger, it's the lack of credibility and the lack of accountability. Um, anyone can just fire away. But to, to, you know, to sit there day after day with your byline and your picture and, and having to go into the clubhouse or the locker room the next day, you know, that's being a journalist. It's not being a journalist, um, but you know, that's, that's the times we live in. We count on citizen journalists in many ways. They tell us sort of the tempo and the, uh, you know, the direction and the, and the, hey, when I wanna know how a beer's trade went, let's say, I listen to sports radio to get a little idea of how people are reacting. But there's a big danger in going that next step and saying that's the way it is and that's what I should reflect as a journalist and that's fact. Um, and then, you know, we're just going back to be re being reporters and, and doing our own original reporting. And so I don't know what point I'm making, but I think that's it's great. a great time for someone else to start talking. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, would, I guess I would make two points. Um, one, I still inherently believe in the quality of people and that most people are good people. Uh, Twitter challenges that for me on a fairly regular basis. <laughs> However, the mute button was a brilliant invention and I think that was a great idea because I used to worry about what everyone was saying and now I only worry about what some of the people are saying because I don't hear the rest of them. Um, but when I started, I worked at the Wisconsin State Journal for 13 years. Uh, they offered buyouts in 2009. I don't think they were expecting one from me. Uh, and I left, I covered the Green Bay Packers final regular uh, preseason game for the paper. And I covered the round of cuts the next day for ESPN Wisconsin, which is kind of a corporate cousin of the real ESPN. Um, and I miss newspapers. I still consume them, although in a different way but I still read all my friends who are still at the State Journal and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. They are my competition when I cover stories. And what they do is extremely important. I think it's ridiculous that they have comment sections because nothing good comes from them, in my opinion. Even when a debate starts out as a civil discussion and people's opinions are valid, it often devolves into uh, conservatives versus liberals arguing about Scott Walker. Uh, at the end of a Packers story, which I'm not quite sure how that happens. Um, the other thing, you mentioned sports radio. I host um, a radio show every day about the Packers. I also uh, do Aaron Rodgers' radio show that we have, um, for which the contract is up. And as I listen to Robert talk, I think most of us are ethical, but most of us are still trying to find our way through this business, because I had an incredible crisis of conscience when I was told that I would be hosting his radio show. Because to me, you don't do that with a guy you cover. Um, I am lucky in that Aaron Rodgers and I have an agreement that I am going to ask him whatever question I'm going to ask him is if I would ask it at his locker and we don't discuss topics beforehand ever. Um, and the one time that I tried to do that, he told me let's not do that again. So he's been terrific to work with in that way. But on the other side of my radio work, hosting a radio show, I'm a terrible radio host because I don't have any hot takes. I'm not an opinionated person. I never have been. I came up covering high school sports and UW, what were called non-revenue sports at the time. And first of all, I just wanted people to read those stories. So I tried to find a way to make them engaging and interesting and maybe write a clever lead once in a while. 
but also because I thought it was my job to start the discussion, not tell people what they should think about the discussion. And so when we do our shows, I come up with our <coughs> topics of discussion. But the complaints I get from the people that are above me always tell me, what was your opinion on that? Well, I kind of like the discussion we had with various opinions. And I, I, my last point would be, and this comes from my good friend Tom Mulhern, who will, uh, will be giving out a scholarship later. He's the one who taught me how to do this job more than anyone else. I had great mentors at the Wisconsin State Journal. Tom Oates. Is that me? No, it's me uh, Rob Hernandez. Uh, Greg Sprout, who's the sports editor there. Uh, Andy Baggett. They have a great group of guys and gals that work at that paper. But Tom Mulhern was really my biggest mentor. And the greatest thing he did was the story was never about him. Um, and that's what I've tried to follow. And the beauty of that is um, it allows people to have discussions about what you write. And it's not about you, and it's not about your opinion. So I try to believe that we can have civil debate and civil discussions. Then I go to Twitter and see the things that get said to Chris from time to time. <laughs> or I see what happens to a guy like Brandon Bostic, whose colossal mistake in the NFC Championship game was one of multiple mistakes that the Packers made that cost them a berth in the Super Bowl, but was probably the last one and the most memorable one and the vitriol we saw directed at him through social media. And that's the one thing I struggle with. When I started at the State Journal, there was this lovely little old lady who would clip my articles and point out my typos that got through the desk every single time. She sent them with a stamp and with a little note, and I couldn't tell if she was sticking it to me or trying to help me. But that was the only interaction I had with readers. And now I post the story, and literally it takes the time for someone to read the story or perhaps just read the 140 character tweet and not bother to read the story to have an opinion on the story. Well, let me ask you this, are we <coughs> making too much of, of new media, of the, of the, of the capacity of, of readers to send mean tweets, to send, to send mean posts uh, on story? Are we just making, do we just ignore it? I, honestly, I don't think you can ignore it. Because the, the pro, and, th and this is again due to my experience in the online environment is that there was a time that you could ignore it back in, say, like 1990, 1991, 92, when, right, when, when your mom and dad needed help programming the VCR and didn't know what the internet was. But these days, there is a computer in every house. Kids have cell phones, kids have iPads. Kids are growing up in an internet environment. And so that, that is their world now, that an online world, a constantly connected world, a constantly social world. And so you are always going to get comments because that's what they're accustomed to. And so rather, like I said before, that, that genie, you're not going to be able to stuff it back in the bottle. It is out and it's not going back. So rather, rather than try to you know, say, no, you can't do that, instead say, how do, we, how do we change this? How do we emulate a better standard of behavior for people to, to follow? And, and part of that is, again, like, like I said, you know, not going with the hot take stories, writing stories that have an actual meaning behind them, that have research, that have facts, that, you know, for, for me, I, I write things that, yeah, I put a lot of swearing in there. I, you know, I, I say some, some, some pretty interesting stuff in, in terms of, uh, you know, scatological references, bad words, things like that. But, the key point behind what I'm saying is that I spend a lot of time making sure that I know what I'm talking about and that what I'm talking about is backed up by facts. So then that way, when someone comes and says, hey, you know, I don't like what you wrote, I'm like, well, why don't you like what I wrote? Is it the tone or is it the facts? And it's, it's really, because if you just write a nasty piece just to be nasty, then people can come after you and say, oh, you're just being a jackass. You're just writing something bad. And you have no rejoinder to that. That's just you trying to get clicks. But if you write a piece where it's your own distinctive style and you throw in your own voice, because every writer needs their own voice, and it's actually backed up by facts and research, then you can respond with, well, if you actually read the piece and you look at the arguments being made, you can see that there is a logical chain of events that leads to this conclusion. Now, they may disagree with that. Everyone has the right to disagree with that. But you are arguing from an informed position as opposed to just shooting something off because you know it will get people angry and start talking about something. So I mean, I, mean I, I think in terms of comments and, and the online environment, it's more a, a broader structural issue that when you're deciding what stories to run, when you're deciding what the thrust of the story is, again, 
What is it that you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to expose a bigger problem? Are you trying to expose a structural flaw? Or are you trying to bring in revenue by appealing to the lowest common denominator? And let's be honest, there are plenty of sites out there that do that. I mean, there, there are sites, and God knows, I've written stuff for Deadspin. Deadspin does that all the time. But they also do stuff where, and you know, ESPN does the same thing. They have incredibly hard-hitting investigative journalism, like with League of Denial. That is fantastic. That should be, that should be the standard for every story. When Deadspin did the Manti Teo story, that should be the standard for every story. But bills have to be paid, and it's all too easy to fall into the trap of, oh, well, I'm just going to write something to get clicks, because I know people are going to talk about it. And then, you know, your advertisers are happy, the, the lights stay on for another month, and life goes on. Manti Teo was a um, great lesson, though, for all of us with, again, doing original reporting. You know, we, we all fall into that trap sometimes. Everybody reported that, in fact, you know, what he said was true, and, and you just, enough people said it, and, and, well, these guys said it, and these guys said it, and then pretty soon you're just sort of part of this massive conversation, and you forget to pick up the phone. It would have been yeah. very easy for so many of us <laughs> to pick up the phone on that. Um, I think a big line that I've seen over the years is going from what you said, <clears throat> and, and I don't mind teeing off on, look at professional athletes are, um, we, we're, we're allowed to, they're public figures, you know, we're, we're allowed to criticize them. Where it, where it starts going over the line, and I've criticized Jay Cutler as much as anyone, but you know, when they start picking on, say, his, his nervous habits, his nervous tics, you know, and then you go from that to um, the big controversy, if you will, wasn't even so much of a controversy, that's like a day in Chicago uh, a couple of weeks ago, the highest rated sports talk station, uh, two, two of their hosts, the midday and morning hosts, were on Twitter having a conversation about a Comcast woman's uh, uh, sportscaster's physical characteristics, um, her breasts, uh, let's just go right out and say it, um, you know, and, and so all of a sudden, they, and it wasn't even that terrible, it was like two or three little back and forth, well it, you know, blew up on Twitter and now everybody was, you know, saying what pigs they are, and I'm going, yes, they're pigs, okay, but has anyone ever listened to their show? They do far worse than that in their show. <laughs> But somehow, because it's just a spoken word and it sort of, you know, evaporates, you know, in midair after it's said, it's not as bad as being yeah. in print. So this was terrible. There are two or three lines. But what it brought, you know, it, it was kind of nice that it brought out everybody saying, you know, that was kind of mean. That was really uncalled for. Because that's, to me, when you start getting personal, um, I don't care mean. Mean is, you know, what's mean? I mean, if you're a columnist and you're not occasionally mean, you're not doing your job. Um, when I covered the Bulls, I had a guy who covered them after me, who was a great guy and, and since passed away, and uh, Terry Armour. And he came up to me once, and he, early on in the beat, and he goes, boy, Jerry Krause hates you, the GM. And I said, yeah, yeah, he hates me. And he said, he loves me, we're best buddies. I go, well, you're not doing your job then. And, you know, we both laughed about it, and he eventually hated him too, so all was well. But, <laughs> You know, mean is, is, is really a, a silly word in their business, but personal is a whole other thing. And, and making fun of Jay Cutler for nervous tics and making fun of him because he has no judgment when he passes the ball is, is two completely different things. To go back to your original question, yeah, we should ignore it better, but I agree with Chris, it's hard. I made one of my New Year's resolutions was I am not going to contribute to trolls on Twitter. <laughs> good luck. I have not done a really good job. I am not, I'm not batting a thousand, but my percentage is higher this year than it has been in the past because I do think, and, and an editor told me this a long time ago, before we used Twitter, it was the old restaurant comment card, right? How often do you fill out the restaurant comment card when you're pleased with your meal? I mean, I try to do it on occasion, but generally it's when your food sucked or your waiter or waitress was obnoxious or whatever, you have a complaint. And so Twitter, by its nature, or comment sections, or, I mean, for me, I use Twitter more than anything else. I sometimes to post pictures of my children, which gets people angry. But um, the, the idea is that more often than not, if someone's going to just read your story and enjoy it and move on with their day, they're probably not going to say anything to you about it. And so you have to take 
that portion of it into consideration when you are responding. I also have people say, you know, I compliment you all the time, Wilde, and you never respond to me. Yeah, what do you want? <laughs> Besides thank you, which I try to send a direct message to them because I don't want to look like I'm taking a victory lap every time I write an occasional story that someone likes. And believe me, I don't write clickbait stories. I have the metrics to prove that. <laughs> um, but the idea that somebody, I, I engage the people who are angry too often, well, those are the people that I feel like, you know, there's a line in the newsroom that Will McAvoy says, right? He's got this exchange with Sam Waterston's character. I don't know if you guys watched the newsroom when it was on HBO, but uh, Sam Waterston asks him what he's doing, and he says, I'm on a mission to civilize. And Sam Waterston's character says, well, how's that going? And he says, <laughs> Well, progress is slow, but I'm in it for the long haul. Um, I've tried to give up that fight a little bit, and it's hard, though. I mean, Chris, I'm sure the interactions that you get, there are a lot of people like me who think that the things that you do are terrific and important. And then there's a bunch of other people that hate your guts without oh, even yeah. knowing who you, they don't, they don't know anything about you, and they can't stand you. And yep. my thought is, is, screw those people, they don't know me. It's, well, and, and, and that's the thing, too, is that like, I generally mute like 99% of those. But the one thing I think people need to understand, and this is more from a, an audience perspective, is that when you send a message to someone on Twitter, yeah, you're just one person sending a message. But if you're one of like 200,000 followers, and that person's getting 50,000 messages, that can be very overwhelming. And, you know, and, and that can happen at any point. I mean, that, that's one of the things that I had to learn is that since I do have a lot of followers, I can't, like, it, if I go after someone, it is very easy for me to bully someone because it's a public forum. If I, that's why I rarely call someone out for their stupidity, and when I do, it's because they really deserve it. <laughs> they've, 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 I, I read their feeds, and yeah, they deserve it. But, um, but no, but, <laughs> sorry, I'm not a good role model. Um, but no, the, the, the thing is, though, is, is that as, as a public figure now, as every athlete is, when, when you're on social media, when, you know, when people are writing stories about you, someone can read a story about you and then just dash off a message on Twitter real quick, and there may be one of like 20,000, 30,000, you know, 5,000, whatever it happens to be, and then you log into your account and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, the whole world's against me, and that sucks. And, I mean, <laughs> and, and I'm not saying, you know, don't, don't write stories that aren't critical of athletes. There absolutely have to be stories critical of athletes. Like, that's, that is what the, the sports journalist media is for. You are the conscience of sports. That is your job. But there is a difference between the conscience of sports and, you know, picking out the issues that matter and then writing a piece on Jay Cutler's nervous kicks. Because that doesn't do anything other than send people after Jay Cutler for no reason. And, and he's the one that has to deal with that. So, I mean, again, that gets back to the whole clickbait mentality. I know I can get interaction from people if I write, if I write something that's you know, denigrating someone else, but am I punching up or am I punching down? And all too often, it's punching down, and, and that doesn't lead to any sort of valuable discourse at all. I would have one other thing. I, my own personal policy, I don't expect everyone to follow it, but... If, if I was covering the Vikings and Chris had punted poorly and I wrote a story about it, or if Chris had been amazing and I wrote a story about it, I've always believed that you have to use the person's Twitter handle either way. Yeah, and I think that's fair. For consistency, because yeah. I, want, I don't want, Cluey sucks, yeah. and I don't put <laughs> Cluey's name. Oh, Cluey's great, and I put his name in. I think you ha there has to be some responsibility in social media. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I, as I sit here and say, well, you just ignore this, I think you also have a responsibility as one of those people to make sure that you're setting that example. And I don't always live up to that, and I get into arguments, and I get my stick-to-football tweets sent to me and everything else. But I, I do think that, on balance, if we take the attitude that we can't let the trolling ruin the medium itself, I do think that there's value in that. I love the fact that people can interact with me about my work more so than the little old lady who sent the mail to the State Journal newsroom. I, I think that it give, I get story ideas. Uh, we don't have the strongest editing at, uh, at our website. Um, I self-edit. Corrections if ever, are fun. <laughs> if you've ever tried to self-edit, you read what you think you wrote. You don't read what you actually wrote. So I have, my, my Twitter editors are terrific. They do a great job <laughs> of pointing out all my typos. And it's not them picking on me. It's them actually helping me. And I appreciate that. I think one was that old lady. I think she's well, now on Twitter. And, and if you were on it more often, maybe you could help me out a little yeah. bit. I'd, I'd be curious what uh, both of you guys think, especially Chris, 
in terms of what the athlete's sort of responsibility is in all this, and by that I mean, I don't know if how many of you guys read about <clears throat> the Thunder's relationship, uh, the Oklahoma team, NBA team's relationship with the media there, which really astounded me. I can't remember who, if it was Deadspin who wrote it, uh, but it was, it was a great long piece about how much at war the beat writers were with the team. And I think that that uh, contemptuousness, if you will, is that a word? Um, from, you know, from the, the, it should be a word if it's not a word. Yeah. Uh, it is now. Yeah. Um, you know, from athletes toward us, we're the enemy, more and more and more, I think. Um, and, and it's not so much we're the enemy, it's, it's the wall that, you know, when I started covering the Bears again, I'm, hate to talk about the old days, but it wasn't that long ago. You know, we could actually speak to players at any given time. We could walk with them to their cars. I'm sure they love that. Yeah. But, you know, we can uh, see them after lunch. We could uh, stop them. Jay Cutler, back to Cutler, he is accessible once and one time only at the podium, you know, during the week, during the season. That's unheard of. We never had that before with quarterbacks. There was always a time that you could just step aside in his locker and talk to a guy. There's none of that. So how do we know Jay Cutler? We don't. We don't even try to. I never pretended to be friends with athletes, but I did, I could tell you that I sort of knew Michael Jordan. I knew Scottie Pippen. I knew these guys. If I see them today, they ask about my kids and I ask about theirs. Um, that doesn't exist at all. They're, they're, and it's not because athletes are making more. Believe me, Michael Jordan was making more than me in 1993. Um, and it didn't matter. There was a civility and a sort of respect, uh, it, it, for sure, to the beat writers who showed up every day, not maybe to Jay Mariotti, who never showed up in the locker room, but, um, but you know, I'm sorry, that's a gratuitous <laughs> shot. That's but, all right. Um, well, well, but, well, but I mean, just, just, you know, I, I'm okay with Jay, but, but in general, guys who didn't show up in the locker room the next day after ripping an athlete, I could see that. But athletes now, there just isn't an opportunity to get to know them in any way beyond the, the podium. And I think that contributes. And what do you yeah, think? Well, so I've got to be honest. My um, first couple of years in the NFL, uh, every player in the locker room, we consider the media as vultures. Like that's you know, just vultures circling the carcass. I trying to see. I appreciate that. Yeah. 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 Glad I didn't cover the Vikings. Yeah. I'm sure yes. the Packers <laughs> never think of a stop. No, before. never, never, no. It's perfect. But no, I mean, I really, but the thing is, as an athlete, once you get to know the people in the locker room, you, you, you begin to know, especially the beat reporters, if a beat reporter is fair, and yeah, they're going to rip you when you do a bad job, but they're also going to highlight when you do a good job, that's fine. As, as players, we get ripped by coaches all the time. That is not something we're not used to. <laughs> like, and I guarantee the stuff they're saying is much worse than what we're reading in the paper. The, the difference is, is when you have reporters that come in and do you know, essentially a hit piece. It's, it's again, looking for clicks. They're, they're trying to manufacture controversy where there isn't one because they know it'll be a story that, yeah, it'll die out in a week or so. And to their, their mind, there's no harm done. You know, whatever, the, the story flared up, it went down. But in the player's mind, it's like, wow, I just took a lot of crap for talking to this person when they just turned it around and took quotes out of context or you know, presented it in a light that made me look really bad. Why am I going to want to interact with anyone else in here? Because I'm just going to get burned again. And there, in, in the NFL, every preseason during, during fall camp, there is a media seminar, at least there was for the Vikings, and uh, there was for the Raiders as well, where they flat out tell you, they have a media professional come in and tell you, you do not have to talk about anything if you don't want to. Don't, you don't even have to say no comment. Just say, you know what, I'd like to move on to something else. And it's, they, they also tell you it's far better to not say anything than to say something that could possibly be controversial. And so I think a big part of what's driving that is, A, the fact that the NFL has become so corporate, it's such a big business, they don't want to risk offending anyone, and then B, the fact that journalism has become big business. I mean, to, to compete with all the stuff that's out there, news has become entertainment. I mean, Fox News is an example of that enough. And in order to compete with all those other sources, there has to be a story, you have to have an angle, you have to drive someone to your site. And that means that, well, you're going to go digging for stuff that may not necessarily be a story, but you can spin it in a way to get people to come to your site and, and then, you know, players shut down. So it's really on both sides is that if you, want, if you want to foster a better understanding between, you know, between athletes, between the people who cover the athletes, well, both sides have to work to understand that, hey, athletes, you know, you can present parts of yourself. You can be an interesting person. You don't just have to be a robot out on the field. And, 
for athletes, that's actually a really good thing if you do become known as a person, because the NFL wants you to be a cog in the machine. They want people to have loyalty to the jersey, not to the name on the jersey. So how, did your, how did your teammates feel when you would be a friendly, <laughs> quotable, you know, uh, accessible guy in locker room? I bet that made you really popular. Yeah, no, actually, they loved it, because that meant that the media <laughs> was... To, yeah, they didn't right, have to talk right, to right. media. <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, cause, cause, and, and for some guys, they just don't want to talk. They want to go out and play football, and they, they regard it as kind of a dirty, necessary part of the job that, yeah, they'll do it if you corner them, but some guys just don't want to talk. I mean, Marshawn Lynch, for example, Please leave Marshawn Lynch alone. The guy doesn't want to talk. Just let him not talk. But again, then that turns into its own story, and it's like, well, now what's the story really being talked about? It, to get back to the whole point of all this, is that ethical to make the fact that Marshawn Lynch isn't talking a story when the guy clearly just wants to be left alone? I mean, there's nothing there to talk about. Why do you care how Marshawn felt on that touchdown run or how many Skittles he ate? That doesn't give you anything, in, that doesn't give you an insight into the game. That's just you wanting to berate Marshawn so you can write something about it. So, I mean, it's, it's stuff like that where, where, again, both sides, you know, the athletes who are personable, who want to talk about this stuff, seek them out, talk to them, and then, you know, maybe ask them, hey, do you, do you know anyone else who, who would like to talk about something? Do you know anyone else? You know, again, not trying to probe for information that is, is, detrimental to someone, although sometimes you do need to probe for information if there is a, an actual investigative story you're working on. In that case, yeah, you should be probing. But if it's just your everyday sports writing story, I mean, talk to guys, establish a rapport. It, you know, make them see that you're a human being because it makes it far more easier to, to actually talk to them as human beings and then present them as human beings as opposed to, oh, here was a person who was out on the field, I'm gonna write this thing and then all these people are gonna go at them. Oh well, my hands are up in the air. I, I don't have anything else to do with it. I wrote my story. That, that's my greatest struggle, though, as a beat writer, because, Chris, what I would want to do is <laughs> talk about the guy you are. Like, X's and O's are part of my job. <laughs> it's my responsibility to cover those aspects. But, you know, I decided I wanted to be a sports writer in the fourth grade. It was fairly clear that the athleticism was not in my <laughs> genes. And I got my first issue of Sports Illustrated in fourth grade. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to be a storyteller. And I, you know, when I go and talk to students and stuff, I always say, you have to love writing more than you love sports. And I think as we've seen, too, there's this kind of cottage industry of all these guys that we now have access to the All-22 film, mm -hmm. and everyone's an expert on the X's and O's or mm -hmm. self-proclaimed expert. And I always hear Jim Mora, Sr.'s voice, when he was the coach of the Saints, saying, you think you know, but you really don't yeah. know, and you never will. And <laughs> There's a subset of people that don't believe that. They know, and don't try to tell them that they know. But I wanted, to be a, I wanted to be a storyteller. Gary Smith is my favorite writer. I would never try to emulate him because he is the best sports feature writer in the history of sports feature writing, in my opinion. But that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell guys stories. And so I started on the Packers in 96, and in 1997, they drafted a kid in the second round out of uh, William & Mary. He was a safety. Uh, ended up going to a bunch of Pro Bowls, ended up playing with the Vikings and then the Saints, and now has turned out mm -hmm. to be yeah. a serial rapist. And I sit here and go, how was I in no way thinking that this guy was anything in Darren Sharper mm -hmm. other than an engaging, charming, interesting guy that I covered? I mean, I wrote stories, I went to his house and interviewed him once, which you know, now it's very hard to get players to do that because their PR staffs tell them, don't let writers do mm -hmm. that. But I thought I, I thought I knew him. And the phrase that I always say to every young reporter and everyone else is, we don't know these guys. Yep. But that's a crisis for me mm -hmm. because I also want to do the job where I can give readers a chance to get to know them better. Right. So it, how do you figure out in that muck where to go as a journalist. That's one of the biggest struggles I have in my job now, is I don't know how to tell Chris Cluey's story. I think I know Chris. Right, but Seems you like a great guy. Yeah. It's right here. But I don't know what he's doing when he leaves, right? <laughs> right. He's raised by it, wild chinchillas. Exactly. Yeah. It's, well, and, and, and again, I think that's where it gets back to the whole underlying concept of, of ethics and telling, telling stories in a way that is, that, Essentially, that's fair. That's not, you're, not, you're not looking to slam someone because, it, again, that race for the bottom with kind of, you know, embrace debate, like that, that is looking for stories 
where it can be controversy, where they can gin up something for someone to talk about. And that, that's the problem because players see that. We, we don't live in a bubble. We watch what's going on. We watch first take. ESPN is playing in the locker room. We see all the stuff that gets reported, and most of the time, all it does is it instills in our minds we can't talk to reporters because they're going to take this and they're going to use it against us. It, it, it's a very adversarial relationship because that's what it's turned into. And I mean, to be fair, it should be an adversarial relationship. It should be, you know, you don't take everything an athlete says at his word. You, if, you, you know, if you're doing investigative reporting, you go investigate, you go look for other sources. But at the same time, it can't be so adversarial where it's just instant shutdown from the person you're trying to get information from. It's just, they just want to lock you out completely because they see what you do and they don't want any part of it because they know it could make them look really, really bad through no do, fault of their own. Do players see shades of gray in the various people that cover the team right oh, now? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Like there, there, there are some reporters that, when I was in the locker room, there were some reporters like, okay, yeah, that's fine. You, know, you, can, you can talk very frankly to that person because they, they won't use that against you. They, know, you know, they know that there's stuff that, yeah, you might say, this other guy in the locker room, he's a dick. I hate that guy. You know, he's just never, never a good teammate to be around. They're not going to turn around and put that in the paper as a highlighted story saying schism in the Vikings locker room because they know you're just bitching around the water cooler. <laughs> like, so someone who walks in <clears throat> doing a feature story who's not a beat writer, who's <laughs> never met, who's never covered the team before, right. has virtually no chance then. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> I, I would say probably not. You, you, you really need to, it, 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 and, and that gets back to the whole problem with the embedding part is that then some people get too close where you know, now, now you're serving as a mouthpiece for the athlete and you absolutely cannot have that because then that drags down your profession and everyone else, all the other reporters are going to look at you and be like, oh, you just sold yourself out in order to, you know, to get some access. And again, that drags the quality down. What I, are you I, really reporting? I can't you know, say that athletes are being unreasonable. One, something you said before just struck me. I remember you know, way back, People would always, and not just athletes, they'd be like, you're just trying to sell papers. You're just trying to sell papers. And you'd always laugh as a journalist at that because we weren't selling papers. You know, the, the bulk of, of revenue for newspapers is advertising and always has been. And, and then you've got people who have subscriptions, right? And so people aren't walking by the, the box, you know, on the street and going, oh, she wrote something, I see a headline, I'm going to buy it. And then it's going to make a huge difference in the, in the revenue of a newspaper. So it's always something to laugh at. But, you know, when you said that, it sort of sent a chill through me that you're right. You can actually, you know, increase traffic with mm -hmm. something ridiculous and sensational. And that power for any dupus that walks through the locker room oh. is frightening. Yeah. And so, it, you know, it's a real problem. I well, mean, now I'm going to go be depressed. But. <laughs> well, and, and, and I will say the, the other thing from an ethics perspective is that Somehow, and I don't know how because it's going to be a hell of a job, you guys need to get all the online bloggers and sports people to get on board with actually taking an ethics class because those people are in locker rooms too. And athletes consider them just as much part of the media as everyone in this room. And so as what other football players do reflects on how people perceive, perceive me, what other journalists do reflects on how athletes perceive all the other journalists. I don't think you need to be worried about the people who are getting credentialed in the locker room yeah. because I don't know about the, the Bears don't let <clears throat> even really bloggers in the locker room. I don't know about the Packers. So you're worried about the guy in the basement, I think, more than anything. Right, but as a player, how much <clears throat> differentiation do you do? I mean, I had an incident this season with Brian Bulaga, the Packers, starting right tackle. Uh, I had said on the radio that if he stays healthy and plays well, there's a chance the Packers won't re-sign him and maybe there's another guy that had lost his starting job who could play right tackle. And that was picked up by a fan blogging site. It was written by someone at that site, tweeted repeatedly, mm -hmm. like literally a dozen times, that finally Brian Belaga's wife saw it. Mm -hmm. And then I had a disagreement with Brian in the locker room over it. He was understandably pissed because right. the way it was framed was not A, what I said, mm -hmm. but B, he kept seeing it on social media. It yeah. didn't matter that it didn't come from a quote unquote legitimate news organization. Now when he and I talked about it, and I said, look, I'm not gonna lie to you. Yeah, I think there's a chance that if you stay healthy all year, they're not gonna pay you and you're gonna be playing somewhere else because it's a weak tackle class and you right. can go play left tackle somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm talking about who they might replace you with, but it's not, hey, they gotta get rid of this Bulaga guy before he gets hurt. Right. And so when it, 
but the problem is, is that if people don't differentiate like that in, on Twitter, I can't expect you guys to differentiate that, and then I have to have that discussion. And you know, I had emailed the person who, ironically enough, I went back in my email archives and had asked me for journalism advice six months earlier. <laughs> yeah. um, Obviously, it didn't take. And I said, I said, you know, this is crap. You, I can't. I don't know. Why did you do this? And his response was, Hey, it's not my problem that somebody in the locker room disagrees with you. But it's clicks. part of my job to face the guys that I, it goes back to what I said about Twitter and mentioning guys. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a problem. I've had, you know, Brett Favre and I have yard, yelled at each other in a locker room before while Aaron Rodgers watched it in 2005. <laughs> um, I, I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of confrontation, but I just want a reasonable discussion about right. what I've written or what I've said. And sometimes, you know, if I'm covering you, Chris, sometimes I'm going to write something that pisses you off. Oh, yeah, no, that's fine. But I would like to think that I would build up enough of a bank mm -hmm. that if I make a withdrawal saying something that, and maybe I'm even wrong about something I wrote, mm -hmm. but I would like to think that over the time that I cover you, I've built a bank that says, you know what, this guy's not just doing a hatchet job on me. Right. He either blew it on this one, or maybe he's writing the truth, and I sucked, or whatever it might be. Well, and that's the thing with players, is that Nine times out of ten, they're going to recognize the fact that, yeah, I did play crappy that game. I had a horrible game. Or, you know, maybe I did lose a step, right? I'm not punting the ball as well as I could have. That guy, I can't, like, yeah, I'm going to be upset because it never, it's never fun to be called out. But at the same time, there are facts behind that. And, and there is an argument laid out there where it's not just your opinion that this guy sucks. It's here's why this guy sucks. And now I have something to say, okay, well, here's why you're wrong with facts of my own. Or, yeah, you're right. I sucked. I need to pick it up. That's, that's on me. I'll do better next time. Can, can athletes really do that? Then? Yeah. Can they, yeah. They, can they, that, that's self-critical? Yeah. Oh, believe, believe me, in the film room, like, okay. as the coaches say, the tape doesn't lie. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, uh, you know when you suck. At this point, we've got about 10 minutes left, and we'd like to. I see our uh, George Fenneman over there with the mic. If anyone has questions uh, for the group, uh-oh. Jesse, Jesse. Bueller. Yeah, uh, you started off talking about uh, like hot takes and kind of that that kind of reporting, and I was I was curious what you feel like the solution is to that because it seems like a lot of the journalists that write the clickbait articles and the, the takes just to get clicks, it seems like they know better. Like a guy like Skip Bayless has a journalism degree; he went through school like this, and you know he does it now, you know, to make money and generate the discussion. So. If, if people that are doing this, the, these, the big time ones, seem to know better, you would think they know better, how do you go about solving this problem? Because it, like, it seems like most people have you know, the ethics that we're talking about, that you, know, you do what's right and you report the truth, but it's just like people aren't doing what they're supposed to. So how do you go about solving that? From a corporate mindset, you stop valuing articles like that. You, you have an ombuds person who says, this is not the standards to which we are expected to uphold ourselves. And we don't care that you brought in two million page views. We're not going. We're going to write it in the contract that you're not. You know, you're not getting paid for that. That's not the type of journalism that we're looking for. Because frankly, at the end of the day, it always comes down to money. You have a job, and you're expected to perform that job. And what that job is is determined by your company. And right now, the companies value those jobs that bring in more viewers, regardless of the quality of the record. Well, but I work for the same company that Skip works for, and <clears throat> what Skip does is an understood format. That, that's, you know, what he does is that show. So I expect people to be smart enough to differentiate between <laughs> what he does and what I do, and I wouldn't be allowed to do what he does. So is that just naive? Is that what you want? I, I, I would say the problem is, is that the people who watch Skip's show do not have that level of intelligence to differentiate between the two. And so they think Skip's show is the gospel truth, and they're going to act like Skip because he is their role model. And so by providing Skip as a role model, you are contributing to the ongoing problem. Yeah, but by holding ESPN.com to different standards, uh, then you're... I'm not saying you personally are, no, are responsible. No, I'm just I'm, saying, I mean... I'm just saying from a long-term corporate mindset, if you continue to value more and more the lowest common denominator, eventually we end up in idiocracy where we're looking for electrolytes. It's... <laughs> we have a... We have a... That's pretty good. We have another question. Uh, Jesse? Hi. Uh, this is for all three of you. I'm wondering if you feel any pressure to tweet Facebook whatever X number of times a day, a week, 
Uh, and if, you, if so, does that, is that pressure coming from your employer or is it self-imposed that you don't want to lose followers? Um, you know, for, in my media outlet, I have no pressure to social media, uh, you know, any more times than I want to. But I know people at other media outlets who, on a weekly basis, they get a printout of how many new followers they have, you know, and that kind of thing. So, and does that affect the quality of uh, tweets and things that are out there? Uh, the only pressure I get is from my wife to tweet less. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> I should tweet more. I mean, I, it, yeah. I think your last I, one was three days ago. Yeah, so you yeah. Can get on I, I'm, you know, I still, I hate to admit it, I still haven't quite grasped. Now, if I was a beat writer still, uh, I absolutely would be more active. Um, I just, and I hate to write it off to sort of my demographic. We're not as into tweeting. Some of us, I'm much more than I have been. I've gotten better at it. I don't believe in watching a game and tweeting a play-by-play. -play. I think that's useless and silly. And I would drop me as a follower if I, you know, if I read me. The, the worst, uh, the worst um, insult I ever got, my 17-year-old son, who was then like 14, came home one day and he said, uh, my friend Alan uh, isn't following you anymore. He said, you're really boring. And I'm like, well, tell Alan, you know. And I saw the kid, and I like, told him off. He was like crying, you know, he's 14. And uh, I said, you know, what, what do you mean I'm not? Mm -hmm. But then I, I realized, no, I'm not active. And so if you're not as active as, as Jason and other guys, you're not going to get followers. Sometimes I wonder how to get more followers. Maybe you could tell me how. Uh, um, I think you could buy them. But you yeah, can, can you buy them? Because I look at some people, I have to be honest, and I'm like, I'm better than them. How do they have 50,000? I'm more compelling. Funnier, but I don't. I, I just can't quite transfer that yet. I'll fully admit it. I need to go to Twitter school or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm self-employed, so I don't really care. I can <laughs> tweet whatever I want. But uh, yeah, the, the key to getting more followers is to not care about getting more yeah, followers yeah, and then yeah. just be yourself. Yeah. Another question. Um, the obviously the biggest story in town here at any given time is University of Wisconsin football. University of Wisconsin basketball. Traditionally, you know, we sort of say stay hands off college athletes, their kids, they're in school and studying, they're not doing this for a living. Well, that line, it seems to me, gets continually blurrier. But the interesting case that happened just recently is that the story of the University of Wisconsin basketball team turned into almost more about what they were doing off the court than what they were doing on the court. And for, and for all the great reasons, They're, they seem to be great kids, they have fun personalities, they seem to understand that college is about having fun and sports are supposed to be fun. But, you know, they're portraying this aspect of their personality on social media. Um, hands off, hands on, um, how do you go about drawing the line there? You know, and sort of a, as an addendum to that, we learned during the tournament that um, a highly sought after recruit had opted to go to the University of Maryland as opposed to Wisconsin, made that announcement you know, on Twitter, did not make himself available to reporters, and said, hey, pay attention to my Twitter today. I'm going to tell everybody where, I, where I'm going to school. I, I'm not even sure that kid's 18, actually. Yeah, it's, um, as, as an athlete, uh, anything I put on social media, I regard as public consumption. Like, it, do, it doesn't matter what it is. I know that it is public. It is out there. People can see it. I think more and more athletes are starting to understand that because essentially that, that's kind of the playing field. It is a public sphere, therefore what you put out there, you know, p people are allowed to access. Um, however, I will say from a journalist perspective, that is going to make your guys' job harder because more and more athletes are also starting to figure out that they can cut out the middleman and just be themselves, like with Derek Jeter's Player Tribune essentially, you know, PR for athletes. Athletes can go on and write their own stuff and be their own journalists. Now, that's not super ethical because, you know, what obligation do they have to, to actually tell the truth? But the, the, the fact is, people want to hear from athletes. They want to hear from their heroes. They will follow the athlete over the journalist who covers that athlete. So your job is, is to, to figure out, okay, how do I compete with the person themselves while still providing an insight that you know that person isn't going to provide of themselves, it, I, it's tricky. Yeah, I, I don't know about Jason. I still treat high school and college athletes differently than professionals. They're not professionals, and that's just what you know what I believe. I mean, there's a certain line that um, 
you know, they opened their self, themselves up, the Wisconsin team, to a certain amount of their personality, which I thought was terrific. And it led to some great stories, and, and it, they let us in, and it was wonderful. And I think America responded to them, and <clears throat> they were a great story. But does that mean we then, you know, go to Frank Kaminsky's house and try to, you know, find out if he had any enemies in high school or whatever? I mean, no. So I, I agree, and I think it's a sliding scale. I think you know, high schools at this end and professionals there and maybe college athletes are a little farther in but not much farther. I want to go back to what Chris was talking about. I mean, I, to me, the biggest challenge that we face, aside from all the other ethical challenges, and was when you mentioned Marshawn Lynch. I mean, at some level, and the reason why I think some reporters, there was an incident with Aaron Rodgers at the NCAA tournament where a reporter got angry that he didn't make himself available and then made us, in my opinion, made us all look bad by basically bitching and moaning about <laughs> they shouldn't trouble. have even been on the court to blow us <laughs> off. But we, it's important that we stay relevant because mm -hmm. I would like to continue to, I'd like to send my kids here someday and be able mm -hmm. to afford it. But at the same time, I think, and Chris, you can speak to this better than I, I think there's still plenty of athletes who understand that. Like, mm -hmm. I think there's plenty of athletes who see the Players' Tribune as a PR arm, oh, as, yeah. as Robert mentioned. And, I think they still see the value in what we do, the good and the bad sometimes. And so I still think there's a place for what we do. I don't know if that'll be the case 25 years from now. I'm sure my kids will hopefully do something more meaningful than sports writing, um, make a difference <laughs> in the world. But, and I love what I do, but you know, I'd rather have my kids at the Carbone Cancer Center curing cancer, because what I get to do is a really great job and I love everything about it. But there are some aspects that I wonder what it'll look like 10, 15, 20 years. Just about to wrap it up. So. Well, we'll also remember that athletes, a lot of athletes are inherently lazy, despite being very good athletes, and they don't want to write their own stories. They're more than happy Thank to have God. you all write their stories. Well, on that, on that note, we, we need to wrap this up. I should note that we tried to get Marshawn Lynch on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> But he told me he wouldn't say anything. So uh, he was so just here not to get fired. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank very much our panelists, a great group. Thank you all again. Thank you so much. That was terrific.